a little conversation. Uh, Professor Tootle, welcome on the last uh, day of the year, New Year's Eve on uh, 2021. How are you? I'm fantastic. This uh, good. Excited about the new year. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of people are. Um, you know, there was a, as you know from watching the news, now that everything is national, um, there was a chance I was going to cancel this show, um, you know, late last night and this morning. I was almost ready to send the message several times because of the fire in Colorado. Um, and I ended up not canceling it because there were no deaths. It looks like, thank God, there weren't any deaths. Um, and I don't have any personal friends that are directly uh, impact indirectly I have a lot of friends um, but, so there's not something like I have to be doing out there you know saving cats or animals or live li livestock or somebody's car or, or you know um, so I decided to go with this but it, there is I wanted this show to be a kind of a haphazard fun show to try to look for some optimism out of 2021 because it seems like a lot of people are addicted to drama and they just want to be down on themselves or other people or or rich people or the president or the past president or you know it's just a lot of people have this gloom thing and i kind of wanted to talk about songs and poems and prose in an uplifting way and, and so i decided to do this so i would like the show to be about that um would you have been surprised if i canceled it because of the fire though i would um i mean our fire season here in california was horrific uh, all year and it was really devastating um, because we've had so many horrible fires here in California. You might think like what's left to burn. <laughs> and in particular, I had always, my area had always been spared somewhat. Um, you know, the fires had always been either to the north or to the south, but not this year. And the fires were so big and so long and so sustained that it really meant that because everybody was supposed to be we couldn't be indoors because of COVID and we couldn't be outdoors because mm. of the fires. And it, it made California seem like, I mean, a prison, <laughs> you know, like what am I supposed to do? Lock myself in my closet for the year. You know, I can't be indoors and I can't be outdoors. And even the places where we would usually flee to get away from smoke or fires, like the coast, like the, the, the smoke was so bad that even at the coast, it, it was, uh, bad air and smoke, you know, which is just completely unheard of. So, and you didn't cancel any shows. No, um, it, my um, the fires came close to my sister and mom, but um, and you know, it's hard to say like what's close when you have fires the size of Connecticut. Like huh. you're like, oh, it only came within a half mile, and you're like, well, yeah, but the fire was. <laughs> you know, hundreds of square miles. And, you know, and then you look at it on a map and you're like, oh, there's only this much separating, you know, my mom and my sister from, you know, from these huge fires that, um, that just never seemed to end. Um, it, I don't know, it would go send us down a bad rabbit hole, but like, I have a lot of very negative things to say about forest management uh, yeah. and the result and, and water storage that are, you know, probably the reason why we have these devastating uh, fires in Colorado and in California. So 2020, uh, 2021 was a bleak year or you're still an optimist? It's hard to say because my, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I have this history mindset that says, um, I don't know what this year means. I'll tell you in 25 or 30 years what this what this year means. No, wait. Now, that's not fair, Professor. Every single Yahoo, and I include myself as a Yahoo, uh, we all have an opinion on everything all the time, no matter if their expertise is required or not. We all have an opinion. As soon as something happens in space or in the oceans or in humanity or somebody we've never met, we all have an opinion and we shout it out on Facebook. And you're saying you don't have an opinion? Well, I'm saying that, like, if you ask me to measure those kinds of things, I usually start with, am I happy? Am I healthy? And am I safe? And am, and my immediate family, are they all happy, healthy, and safe? And if we've all made it through another year uh, of being happy and healthy and safe, then this is, this was a good year. Okay. Um, well, how about society then? Or is society happy, happy, healthy, and safe? You won't don't have an opinion? I, I have... Uh, in, I have some dark inclinations, but I, uh, but I'm, I'm open to being wrong. And okay. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I'm wrong. Yeah, fair enough. So um, uh, today's show, 
Um, I, I want, as I said, I wanted to do this intentionally to see if there were some bright spots, um, including bright spots that are kind of unifying. Um, and, and at least in my opinion, um, I'm not an artist. I'm not a musician. I'm not even a great aficionado of art or music. I, I'm just an average Joe kind of guy. Um, but I, at least in my experience of going to concerts and listening to a common song in the radio when you're driving along in the car or something, um, there's a lot of unifying feelings when a cool song comes on with a great beat or a neat lyric that it kind of doesn't matter whether you're old or young or black or white or male or female or something. Just go, oh, that's a cool song. And, and it kind of unites people around at least those songs or beat or lyrics. Is that, do you agree with that? Yes. So what is it about art? Um, that, and, and art can be incredibly divisive as well. And, and usually the artists intend to be divisive when they do so. But what is it about art or maybe more specifically the art of the written word when well done um, can move people, can, can maybe not change their lifestyle or their opinion of something, but maybe, I mean, maybe it does affect them in ways we don't know versus a political rant or a, a political argument where music and prose and poetry can make people change or at least have a, a respite um, of their of their no normal modus operandi. What are your thoughts on that? Well, part of it is um, uniquely some part of it is universal and part of it is uniquely American. So, but the part of it that's universal is that most great art is about communicating, and we consider these things to be great when they are effectively communicating things to um, uh, to other people. In other words, this 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 art, this creative pr product, is um, being used to connect with other people. And um, but the sort of uniquely American thing is to make great art that is accessible and popular. Mm. So the you know the the amazing thing about one of the amazing things about America is that is how good our popular culture is. So that you know, and this dates back to us having such a literate culture that great artists could make a living if they were able to make their great art accessible. So you think about somebody like a Nathaniel Hawthorne or a Herman Melville, or maybe the most, maybe the best example of this would be somebody like Edgar Allan Poe. They're, they're making readable stories that are also great art, you know, and Melville, everybody thinks, you know, this is an exciting whaling story, but he's sneaking in the, the great art. And the same goes for, um, you know, why we would consider somebody like Brian Wilson or the Beach Boys to be this great genius is that, you know, he's, he's making this uh, great art and maybe the, the, the album that's the example of that would be Pet Sounds. But the song that really exemplifies this is the song Good Vibrations, which is, you know, it's insane what's in that song. <laughs> <laughs> the, and yet it was still, you know, had a good beat and you could dance to it. And, you know, uh, well, well, well delve, in, delve into that specifically, because I saw uh, the Beach Boys at the old Mile High Stadium before it got tor torn down. So in that song, what do you mean it's insane what's in that song? What's what, well, I mean, it, it, the, so if you think about the song structure itself, it's a non-conventional song structure, the the um, the um, the elements of classical music that went into the um, um, creating the counter melodies that are essentially built on um, a little boogie woogie dun 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 like that the good vibrations part is put on top of it then the classical in instrumentation then the technology and skill of the engineers to capture those moments um, you know so you have the best songwriter the best you know the best of everything brought into this one um you know, pop song, <laughs> uh, and, and um, along with the experimentation, the use of the theremin, but in such a way that it blends with classical instruments to sound normal. It, it, and if you think about, like, I was thinking about one of the best songs um, that I heard that I that has a 2021 release date. It was a Randy Newman piano song that was in a Disney movie. Which one? Um, it was some something from Toy Story 2 that was re-released as a piano suite. And uh, you think about somebody like a Randy Newman, he's a perfect example of this, right? He's, he's doing incredibly complicated pop 
classical art music and yet making it possible that he's also the guy who wrote you got a friend in me you know <laughs> and uh that's that's a really unique artistic skill set that somebody like a randy newman has um you know it's interesting that you'd bring that up professor because one of one of my songs that wasn't released this year um i don't think but maybe it's in the same movie is um uh, when she loved me by sarah mclaughlin which i think was also in one of the toy story movies if my memory is correct yeah and, and the ability to bring together all of this skill all of this technique all these technicians all of the the best of the best of the best in order to produce this product that is both artistic and accessible is really something that is amazing you know uh, we make great pop culture that uh so one of the you know people would sometimes say like the failing of america is the lack of high art or that are only you know we've only got two contributions to high art and that would be jazz and cinema but um uh, you know, I'm saying that's what people say. I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not enough of a high art critic to know why, you know, Russian literature and, and um, Persian poetry is considered the best, you know, like, uh, but, um, uh, I, you know, it's just what people say, but in terms of America's great contributions to the, the world of art is that we've given the world cinema and we've given the world jazz, you know, uh, but that's it. Yeah. Um, so, so let me pause you there for a second. Um, why uh, does it come naturally to you and I, and I've already said that I'm not a music aficionado, you probably are, um, but why do two guys who do a series on American history, um, why do we pause once in a while to say, yeah, there's lots of history for us to discuss, but we should really just kind of stop and talk about you know, fun or culture or music or something interesting. I, I, I think I'm being intentional on this, but I, I don't know if I can articulate it. Do you have a, why do you just immediately say, good idea, John, let's have a show on that? Well, I think it was something that comes about through life experience, which is I, one of the best, one of the moments when I felt happiest to be alive was I was um, asked to go to coffee with these two professors at Ohio University named Bruce Steiner and Steve Miner. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be amazing. I'm gonna to listen to these two historians talk about history. And, and the, they sat down and they talked about art, <laughs> music and religion and politics and the depth that they were discussing in philosophy and the, the depth that they were discussing these topics with, it was just, um, it was exciting and it was, I, I, I use the word intoxicating, um, but I think that people who, I, I know that people just sometimes have a different reaction to different art forms, but I, I don't think it's uncommon for the same people who find ideas to be intoxicating uh, to also find art intoxicating. If you mm -hmm. have the mindset of someone who is open to, um, you know, experiencing depth, I think that translates to many areas of life. Uh, uh, and it's one of the things if we're being, if I'm being pessimistic, uh, that I worry it has been lost in especially higher education over the last 25 years. And um, so uh, to get back on the positive note, I'll just say we should we should be happy <laughs> that we get to experience that kind of joy with uh, um, with a depth. And the word that I always use when I describe this is is resonance. You know, mm -hmm. there's a um, something resonates within the human heart that you know it, you and you are in a way communicating with this artist. And yes, it's the artist who creates it, but it but it finds depth and it finds meaning. Um, when the listener listens or when the reader reads uh, or, or when the speaker speaks or you know, uh, it's kind of like, I'm sure anybody who's ever been in a music creative environment where, you know, or even if you sing in church, you know, there's just such a difference between singing alone in your house and joining your voice with other voices uh, and experiencing great art is like that it's um it's something you are experiencing and it's something you're a part of 
Love that. Ah, boy, this is an interesting topic so far. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your willingness to discuss it. So um, let's talk a couple of minutes about specific, um, I don't know whether to go to specific songs or uh, genres of music. Um, and I don't mean to pin you down because maybe you haven't had time to think about it. Um, no, I'm but, ready. I'm... But is there is there a couple songs from 2021 of any genre uh, that, that stand out? Or was this kind of a bleak year in the decade of great songs compared to the 80s, which was the best decade in the history of the human race? But uh, yes, but and you will have not heard of any of these, but um, uh, uh, it's one of the reasons though I was excited, by the way, to have this show is because I know you're going to expose me to some things I would never, ever run into in my whole life. No one will ever mention these songs to me or music or whatever you're going to mention. And so please, even if it doesn't resonate now, it may in the future. Well, my favorite song that was released this year was probably Band of Horses Crutch. Uh, uh, band of Horses is the band, Crutch is the song. Uh, some other songs that I really liked, um, uh, uh, Courtney Barnett, Snail Mail, Ceramic Animal, The Dip, <laughs> Katie Kirby, um, and uh, Marion Gendrum. Um, and those were kind of the songs that hit me the most. The other one was, um, I, I think I've mentioned that I love the band The Jayhawks, but the um, the, the lead singer of the Jayhawks put out a solo album this year. His name's Gary Loris. And um, he put out this song called Follow that was such a sweet and wonderful, it, that maybe that's my favorite song of this past year because he, he got into a new relationship and he wrote this song, I think, for a relative's wedding. And he just wanted to write a sweet love song and he did. And, it, and the, even the video for it is just so nice it's like a nice reminder of that human beings can be in love you know <laughs> uh, um so i love gary loris i love the jayhawks and i love that song follow and it's don't expect it to be some soaring anthem or something it's just a it's just a beautiful little song about falling in love um cass mccombs oh here's another sort of offbeat thing um this band called the beths who are a New Zealand garage band, uh, you know, kind of a rock and roll, but they put out a live album. And when I was listening to it, I was just reminded of how great it is to like see a, a real rock and roll band play live. And so it, even though it's not an album of new material, somehow it hit me harder that it was like a live album. Um, and they're just called the Beths. Um, if you really want some offbeat, jazzy, wacky, um, uh, stuff there's a a, a a music thing i don't know if i should call them a band or not called the magic lantern um but it's very jazzy sort of experimental um the um if you like it, when you think about like what is universal about music the the person i recommend that's making good music and still in um uh, 2021 is Nick Freitas, uh, N-I-K, and the last name is Freitas, F-R-E-I-T-A-S, and um, if it's one of those things like you can't say you like the Beatles and then listen to Nick Freitas and say, oh no, I'm not into that. Like if if you like the Beatles, you'll like Nick Freitas, uh, and he's got such an incredible back catalog too. I'm always shocked that. Um, that I'm shocked that he's not famous. You know, why isn't he as famous as the Beatles? I, I don't. I don't know. He's um, he's an incredible musician. But number one artist, the one who we're still going to be listening to 50 years from now, and we'll all sit around saying, "Oh my gosh, that we were all alive when that guy was making music," is a country artist by the name of Charlie Crockett. Charlie Crockett is, to my mind the unique singular artist who is putting out music at the top of his game right now and doing so in a way that sort of soars above <laughs> everything else that's going on in that sort of uniquely, again, I'm sort of like biased about this, but like in this sort of uniquely American way, because when you listen to him, on one hand, it sounds like he's making music that could have been released in Nashville in 1959 or 1963. So you can enjoy it in a sense that you can enjoy like Nashville country. 
But on the other hand, he's somebody who is from this really unique border community in Texas so that he draws in the Texas version of country, but also like Texas blues. But he also spent years busking in Louisiana. So there are these elements of New, of New Orleans jazz. But because he's also on the border with Mexico, there are these little moments that you just that, that throw in like it's like almost Mexican. But all of these things are just subtle. And none of them would be there if he wasn't him, if he wasn't born and raised in this sort of border region that brings together Texas, Mexico, and New Orleans. Um, but I don't want you to get the feeling that what you're going to get is any of those things. Go into it expecting to hear um, late 50s, early 60s Nashville, but with these elements that are just extraordinary. And then he also makes good videos, you know, and he's an amazing live artist. If you have a chance to see him live, he just played in Red Rocks in Colorado not too long ago. Well, um, so he, he's obviously a star if he played at Red Rocks, but is he famous? Is he rich? I don't know because I don't know who gets to count themselves as being famous anymore. I mean, it, the he didn't it's funny because i don't he became more famous during the pandemic and so when they first started having shows uh he was shocked that all of his shows were selling out because he had no idea how famous he had become mm. in the interim because like it turns out that you know he was booking himself in what you might call larger clubs and then finding that everything was sold out and so then, you know, he goes and plays at Red Rocks, sells out Red Rocks. And you're like, well, I guess he must be famous, but there is no pop music anymore. So how would you know? Um, you know, in, in, in a way, um, um, I guess it'd be like, uh, I was thinking about John Mayer the other day, uh, the guitar player. And like, he's famous, but is there's no MTV anymore. So, you know, he put out a very good album last year. Um, and um, I'm not, you know, a super fan or anything, but like the guy is an undeniable talent, you know? Um, and I'll always sort of listen just because, I, you know, he's just an amazing musician um, to see if there's any songs that sort of catch my ear. But um but, you know, is, does, is John Mayer still famous? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't know. Hard to tell, isn't it? Yeah, because our media environment is so fragmented. So, so Professor, remember, because uh, it sounds like you have another track or two you'd still like to talk to about. And so I'd like to go back to that. Okay. Uh, I'll say the other song ahead. really hit me was um, um, the Beach Boys re-released um, a box set called Feel Flows, which was from their period right after um, uh, Pet Sounds. And it had some of my favorite songs of all time. And, it, one, of the, and one of the songs I listened to the most in 2021 was a reworked Mike Love song called uh, Big Sur, which is a song that kind of sounded like, um, uh, what's that song, the, the Piano Man or mm. Mr. Bojangles and its original yeah. whatever. But in this re-released version, it's an amazing song and you wonder like, why did they release that kind of crappy Mr. Bojangles version of it when they had this amazing, um, you know, thing in the can in the studio. Um, I'm, just, I'm just scrolling through the, um, and then the, of course, the other thing, uh, kind of music and music, music and cinema was the release of the, the Beatles, um, get back Dr. no Ray. doubt that i haven't finished it by the way and to, and to be frank i guess i'm the only one i, I my wife and i kind of got bored two-thirds of the way through and we haven't made it to the final I, uh, i've watched the whole thing from beginning to end probably five or six times wow <laughs> well it just shows the difference between a music aficionado and somebody who gets bored easily <laughs> so bravo for you and and boo for me um, but no doubt, that was a masterpiece um, that happened in 2021. Uh, to think that we're, you almost feel like you're sitting there with John and Paul. It, it's really unique. Yeah. yeah. That happened. So um, let me do a bridge um, between all these awesome current events 
uh, current songs and artists that are playing in 2021. Thank you for that. I had no idea you'd have a whole list of folks. Let me do a bridge of a couple of layman's um, songs that have been important in my life. So say we did this year. Now let's go over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, and you just give a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a yay or nay, of whether this is an important song in American culture or American history, whether, and I, I assume you'll know them all, but, but I'm going to give you like 10. I have a list of 50, but I'm going to give you like 10, just yay or nay. Ready? Okay. Yeah. Nights in White Satin by the Moody Blues. Popular, uh, never hit me. The Boxer, Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, definitely important. It's an important, that's a really important one. You were going to be wrong if you said no on that one. Um, Louis or Louis Armstrong, what a wonderful world. Absolutely. At, 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 old, yeah, undeniable. Yeah. Undeniable. It just, and especially the year, I think it was 1967. So, uh, I mean, we're talking like strife. Uh, when it, at least one of the videos that I watched him recently, uh, when he played on TV, it was 1967, I think. Uh, maybe I'm confused. I, I, I looked up a lot of songs for the show. But I'm telling you, what a weird time in the world back then and what a weird time in the world is right now. And how does music affect us? Um, hallelujah. The interesting about Louis Armstrong is yeah. that, uh, that at one time it was true that he had had a hit by the definition of what a hit was in yeah. every decade of the 20th century. Wow. Really? Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's top five, top seven recordings were hits even before there was recorded music they would sell sheet music wow well that really is interesting um hallelujah by rufus wainwright well the yes uh, uh, maybe not his version of it but, but the whole the, yeah but the song <laughs> hallelujah by leonard cohen uh yeah. i still think the definitive version is probably the jeff buckley uh, version oh this is such a fun interview i'll look that up uh tears in heaven eric clapton mm -hmm. Not really. Uh, Stand by me, Ben E. King. Absolutely, yes. Nice. Uh, back to the Beatles. Let it be. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's you know. It's hard to pick one out of their canon, but I'm not sure it would be that. Yeah, one. they they spent like a whole hour on Let It Be during the Beatles thing. Of course, it's one of the most important songs. It's. I mean, it, yes. I. I. Uh, in so far as I think it's one of those songs that almost spawned its own genre of music, you know, it's hard to imagine Adele putting out any albums if the song "Let It Be" had had never existed. Okay, you sure. Know? Like every every Adele song is essentially like trying to be "Let It." Okay, <laughs> keeps, so you're making my point. Fun. Thank you. You change your mind. Good. Um, here's an odd one that you'll probably want to agree with: uh, "Death Cab for Cutie." I will follow you in the dark. It's a great song. Um, I don't know if it rises to the sort of pantheon, um, <laughs> but it, it's certainly a great song. I, I love that song. <laughs> cool. Um, how about uh, last one? And I'm skipping a bunch of them. Um, uh, James Taylor, uh, Fire and Rain. No. Oh, God, Professor, that's all it's about. That's called life. I've seen fire. I've seen rain. I, oh, my God. It's just like that's you describe the you describe my lifetime. Yeah. Um, I just, when I'm, when I'm in that mood, I much prefer um, Jackson Brown. Nice. Uh, I just feel like why well, I listen to James Taylor when there's a Jackson Brown. <laughs> I love James Taylor, but Jackson Brown's cool too. All right. So but I just feel like Jackson Brown has an edge and a depth and a soulfulness that James Taylor just doesn't have. Fair enough. Could be a preference. I gave you a list of 10 when there's hundreds more that we both could give. Do you have some in your lifetime that, hey, John, when we're studying history and we think about American culture, these are two or three or four or five or 10 songs that we should all think about that define America and Americans? Oh, um, you mean for me personally or? Yeah, that I would yeah or just things we should think about. We're trying to expand people's experience. What would you like to share about your lifetime of experience in music? Or poetry, well, or poems. Have, you know, it's funny. I, as far as the songs that are meaningful to me personally, those are very different than the ones that I would say are really important for. I would never make the claim that the stuff that I like personally is deserves to be in the pantheon of like great art of of all time. You know, um, because there are so many artists who I. Um, 
going. Keep going. Keep going. Professor, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, good. Keep going then. Are you back? Oh, I, yeah. I lost my audio for a second. Um, what was, so for me, um, an album that was very important to me was the Pavement album, Slanted and Enchanted, and then the, the follow-up to it, Watery Domestic. But, you know, I, I know very well that the average person would put on that record and hate it. <laughs> But it hit me at a particular time in my life that that it became far more important to me than it would ever be to anybody else. And and so I always go back to for me, um, and, and it's weird because you say as an American, but most of the great bands tend to be British, and most of the great great solo artists are, tend to be Americans. So. Um, but I always rank uh, Pavement, the Beach Boys, the Kinks, and the Clash as being um, my kind of touchstone artists. And then in terms of other people, you know, and then you, I start thinking about these artists who you, it's almost impossible to imagine popular culture without these people. But like a James Brown, for instance. Elvis. Yeah. yeah. Um, although my... Elvis was really important to me in my own musical journey. He was the first artist who I really felt that feeling that you get from music where it just feels like you're being shot through your whole body with electricity. That was the first time I heard Elvis. I, I just, I, I mean, I was, I was a little kid, but it just blew my mind, you know, um, what was happening to me when I heard him. And then from there, I moved. The next artist that hit me that way was the Beach Boys. Um, you know, first I heard Elvis, then I heard the Beach Boys, and then um, and then I listened to pretty much nothing but the Beach Boys until I started listening to um, the King. Eagles. No, in fact, I have a very controversial opinion about the the Eagles. Uh, Seven Bridges Road, Professor. Sorry. And you know, I have a good tie-in story that that proves that I'm right. Um, that involves the Beach Boys. So you know, there was this Beach Boys movie called Love and Mercy a few years ago that came out. It was about Brian Wilson's um, mental health. By the way, if you haven't seen that, go watch that movie. That would that really should have won for Best Picture. Uh, it was an amazing movie. Uh, it's called Love and Mercy. Um, but John Cusack plays the older, mentally ill Brian Wilson. And he was doing research on the movie um, by following around Brian Wilson. So the story I'm about to tell you is true, according to witnesses who were there, including John Cusack, who has confirmed that this story I'm about to tell you is true. So um, members of the Eagles, and I'm not sure which, I can't remember which ones, but at least two of them came back to um, say hi to Brian Wilson after one of his concerts. And one of the side effects of Brian Wilson's mental illness is that he's, he can't lie. He's sort of childlike in how he just has to always tell the truth all the time. Wow. And um, they asked for him to sign something. And I think it was, I don't know if it's Glenn Fry or, uh, but, uh, but two guys from the Eagles and Brian Wilson starts to write an autograph out to the Eagles. And he writes, thanks for all the great music. And he starts to hand it to them and he stops and he looks at it, takes it back, crosses out great and writes good <laughs> and then hands it back to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to me, that is the perfect description of what the Eagles are, which is they are as good as you can possibly be without being great. And I look at the individual talent of the members and I, and I don't say to myself, wow, it's amazing how good they are. I always say like, why isn't it better? You know, <laughs> yeah. these guys are so talented. They're all amazing musicians. They're all uh, uh, um, really good songwriters, really good singers, <laughs> harmonies. they have everything that you should have. 
like, and I always think like, why isn't this better? I, um, so uh, I had no idea the last day of 2021 would be a takedown of one of my favorite groups of all time. But so yeah, I'm telling you, they are as good as they can possibly be without ever achieving greatness. Uh, <laughs> so damn funny. So um, uh, you have a chance to shout out a couple more groups or songs in your lifetime that are significant for America or Americans, or at least expose us to something that we should think about in a positive sense only. Uh, don't worry about critiquing any folks. Is there anything any, anything come to mind or I can go to my next question? Well, I mean, other than Charlie Crockett and Nick Freitas not being famous, you know, another thing I'll throw out there, if somebody wants to listen to something like really unique and that nobody's heard probably, um, there's a an instrumental combo called the Flying Tigers. You can find them on um, uh, Spotify. And I think that, you know, it's one of these groups that has less than a thousand <laughs> streams, so <laughs> not popular, uh, but- I, That means they've made like $1. They've made no money, you know, yeah. or, or the same goes with me. You know, I, I you know, my, my albums have been up for years and I, I still get a royalty check, you know, once a year for like $10 or something. Hey! Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and um, yeah, uh, so I would just say like Nick Freitas, Charlie Crockett. I, I always want to shout out Mira, although she only put out one song last year. Um, um, hey, well, I'm going to remind you of one that you're missing. And so I'd like you to take a minute or two to talk about why. Okay. Johnny Cash. Oh, Johnny Cash. That, no, I mean, just if you if I had made this list beforehand, I, he's one of the most important artists. And I also Johnny Cash's book is my favorite book. So, if you so wanna, give us a couple of lines on that. If people didn't turn into our other show we did last spring, give give a little that that to me is still surprising, and I have not read the book. So tell us about it. It's just a it's just a incredibly moving book that makes you that gives you an insight into his um, his music and his life and his theology and his philosophy that 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 helps you to understand just what a monumental presence he was in American music, but beyond that, the depth of what he was doing, um, because so much of it was instinctual, um, but he really was an artist um, and a uniquely American artist. And I think that, um, it, and it's funny to contrast, I was going to say, like, you contrast his autobiography, or because he wrote more than one, but just Cash by Johnny Cash is the good one. But if you contrast that with like Merle Haggard, who is another person who I consider to be in the pantheon of great American artists of all time. Um, it, and, you know, <laughs> Merle Haggard's autobiography is just about a lot of st car stealing. Like it turns out he just, you know, it's mostly about jailbreaks and car stealing and stuff like that. You don't really get a flavor for the, the kind of depth of a person that Merle Haggard was by reading his book. Um, but um, Cash by Johnny Cash is an incredible book, but um, I, I just feel like Merle Haggard and Johnny Cash are, and Lefty Frizzell, let's throw out, if, if that's another artist that people might overlook, but if you want to know somebody who, in particular, Merle Haggard really admired, um, go back and revisit the catalog of Lefty Frizzell, um, just incredible. Okay, so Professor, um, we're, we're going long on time already, but I have like, you know, 10 more questions, but I'm going to try to do three. Uh, forgive me uh, for jumping around on this. So that you'll have to like shift gears rapidly with me. Going back historically in the country, and I, and so I'm thinking the Battle Hymn of the Republic, the Star Spangled Banner, um, you know, those kind of historic songs that led us to who we are as a nation. Are those still valid today? Are those things that we should be teaching our children and singing and after church choir? But I mean, are they things that are define America? I have a sense that they're not as important to anybody under 40 now. I, I don't know if they listen to them or care about them. Um, I like America the Beautiful, particularly because it was in Colorado. But, but And I know there's controversy over Francis Scott Key and the, I think it's the third, third verse. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Give us your historical approach now to music over the last couple hundred years in America. 
Well, uh, I would say it should be, and I would hope so, but I'm worried that it's not. And, and it's because what everybody is afraid of is offending someone. And um, I think, it, uh, you know, and I'm using my own kids schools as an example of this, but also other people who I know uh, who have kids, uh, you know, they go, uh, schools now go for whatever the most inoffensive, you know, what's a song that won't offend anybody, um, uh, kind of a song, and any display of unity or patriotism is going to be, uh, meet with some sort of complaint or protest, and so the easy thing to do is to just eliminate it. And th that's really how most of this stuff happens. It's, I mean, people assume that, you know, school administrators are evil, but they're really just lazy. You know, all administrators are lazy, <laughs> you know, like everyone who gets up and, and, and goes to work every day, you know, they, they want to avoid problems. And if there's an easy solution, They'll just go with whatever is easy. So, so if it, adverse, if it, to, adverse to controversy may be more accurate than lazy, correct? Yeah. Well, if you were to say no, we, I think it's important that that we that we sing "America the Beautiful" at the next school assembly. Then what's going to happen is you're going to have a lot of work, and you might lose your job. And it, so, why do that? <laughs> I'll just go with Feliz Navidad and. Uh, um, and we'll move, get on with our lives. Um, so that's, that's really the way that um, cancel culture works and this sort of new McCarthyism. I, I did see that there was a Pew um, uh, finding on um, self-censorship and the level of self-censorship in America in the year 2021 was double that of the highest point during the McCarthy era. So if you want to know what McCarthyism was like, know that what we're experiencing right now is double <laughs> in terms of self-censorship. Uh, well, let's consider that on another show. But um, just to prove your point, I, what I think that also means is why everybody on both sides of the spectrum are constantly surprised because they truly don't hear from a lot of people that have very strong opinions, but they just keep their mouth quiet. Is yeah. that you know, so they're surprised when the election turns out differently than they thought. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, that's worthy of another show. Um, give me, a, I, I threw out a couple, uh, you know, the Star Spangled Banner and America the Beautiful. Is there, are there some genres or major songs, though, that if you're an American or if you want to understand America, of course you should. And I know you're not a, a, an art historian and a music historian. You're a political, <laughs> political history uh, historian. But are there things that since you love music that, Hey, everybody should really listen to the following five or 10 songs over the last couple hundred years or 50 songs. Can you just throw out some that maybe we should consider? Well, just they tend to be in the sort of what's called the great American songbook. So mm -hmm. I, if you think about the artist, I, I, I tend to think of it this way. If you do a deep dive into the career of a handful of artists, you will experience all of the songs of the so-called great American songbook. And so Louis Armstrong is definitely one of those artists. But if you just do a deep dive on Frank Sinatra, or and Dean Martin is often overlooked, but Dean Martin is a fantastic singer and had great people uh, working for him um, also. So, you know, Dean Martin's output was is often overlooked and wrongfully so. Uh, Bing Crosby would be another. But I think if you just did a kind of deep dive into the careers of Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin, you would you would exp you would hear all of those songs in the so-called Great American Songbook. And like old folk songs, or the, is that in there too? Yeah, I mean, there's that Smithsonian Folkways collection. That's kind of the yeah. But uh, I tend to think that those things are better if you the more pal if you want to listen to that stuff. Listen to Merle Haggard, you know, because Merle Haggard had such a uh, a keen sense of history that if you listen to the Merle Haggard songbook, he incorporates all of that stuff into his music. And then, if you want to go back and listen to the Carter Family or Johnny Ca and Johnny Cash is the same way. Both of these guys were so steeped in American uh, folk history, 
but I mean, if you want to go back and listen to like the Carter family, I mean, the Carter family, what he essentially did was he stole folk songs. He, he just became the person who recorded every folk song in every region of the country and then said he wrote them and got the publishing credit for it. But, but like John Carter collected all of the American folk songs and had his family perform them. So, you know, again, if you want to hear basically every folk song in, in American history, just like listen to every Carter family, you know, album. Fascinating. Um, I, I've got to switch gears one more time and then we'll see if Bart or Tony or Ben have any questions. Well, I do have like a couple of other things that I want to make Please. sure and include, and they would be some of the books. And one of the like books that I really think that, that people need to be made aware of is this book called American Geography by Matt Black. He is a photographer who uh, takes pictures of poverty. <laughs> uh, and this book is as important and moving as you know, the works of Dorothea Lange in the 1930s. Um, it's an extraordinary achievement, an extraordinary work of art. Um, and, uh, and, and this book did just come out. It's brand new. It's just called American Geography by Matt Black. Awesome. Um, it's a little expensive, but if you have any interest in photography or poverty issues, you absolutely need to pick this up. And then the other book, uh, sorry to just, hijack this but i want to get these in i'm glad the other other books that are not necessarily history that i think people need to read one of them is this new translation of the gospels uh we've never really talked about religion too much but the the, reading a good translation of the gospels that's heavily annotated will um it really helps examine what your faith is based upon in a serious and profound way. So it's a short book. Gospels are short, you know, but if you really read this slowly (laughs) and go through the notes and consider, you know, uh, I, if if you're a person of faith, um, this will be a profoundly uh, life-changing experience for you to read a book like this. Excellent. Um, and then uh, it's not necessarily history, but I have a couple of books that are history slash contemporary related. But I think maybe the most important book on social issues is probably this John McWhorter Woke Racism book that came out in 2021. It's in many ways, it takes somebody up like a John McWhorter, who's just one of the He's just a brilliant, I mean, he's a brilliant linguist. Um, that, that's what he is by profession. And he does a series of debates with somebody else. Glenn Lowry, who's an economist. Okay. And I, and I highly recommend their conversations because, again, it's like anybody who likes ideas, you just, it's such a privilege to sit down and listen to John McWhorter talk to Glenn Lowry. You know, I, I just can't believe there's this thing called a podcast that allows me to listen to a conversation between Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter. I mean, it, it's it, it really feels like a privilege every time I listen to a new episode of, uh, of uh, those two guys. But so he sat down, he wrote this book. It's short. It, it's concise. But the the um, the ideas that it contains and the sort of systematic it seems to have had a kind of galvanizing effect on popular culture in a way, because now you have people like John McWhorter and um, who's the guy from Politically Incorrect, the comedian? Oh, uh, well, it's not uh, John Stewart. Um, no, no, no. Who's that guy? Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. He's not called Politically Incorrect. Real time, Bill Maher. Yeah, Bill Maher. So you, now you're starting to get people like um, Dave Chappelle, Bill Maher, um, um, the Harry Potter uh, lady who uh-huh. wrote Harry Potter. Oh, uh, like J.K. Rowling, one of the most J.K. Rowling people right. in the world. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, and um, you're starting to get these people who are just starting to push back on the absurdities and say, like, enough is enough. Like, it's time for like normal people to have at least room for reasonable debate. Uh, and I think that in many ways, like this book, the John McWhorter book, you want to, 
if the tide does turn, it does seem like this book became one of those inflection points that where people said, yes, he's right. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to say, I agree with John the quarter, like, and I, and as he did his speaking tour for this book, what was really remarkable was like, if you watched him being interviewed, every place he went, everybody who talked to him was just like, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> you know, like, I, and you're right. We, this is, this has gone too far. And we, you know, uh, and it, but it took somebody actually making the case and writing the book. So I think that book's really important. Another point of per personal privilege is I will plug my friend Derek's book, um, uh, Flashpoint. This is, uh, it's about a rugby event and how it, it, it um, sparked the anti-apartheid movement in the United States. And um, it's, a good, it's a good example also of why it's important to read more than one history book. Because if you only read one history book, you, you sort of get one perspective. But when you start reading some of these books like this that are about this event and you learn, you start caring about the characters and the people involved, um, you realize, oh, this is how racism played out in, the, in this area, you know, in this little in, in rugby and in, in the American civil rights movement and the South African anti-apartheid movement. And you realize like, sports and civil rights and all of this stuff kind of matters. And the other thing that's great about this book is it has the world's greatest um, acknowledgement, which I will read out loud to you. Um, uh, the, uh, is your name in it, Professor? Yes. Uh, let me just read the final, the final line in the acknowledgements. Uh, as always, the courteous thing for me to write is that all the faults that exist in this book are my own. Unfortunately, that is not true. All of the wisdom, insight, and cleverness, cleverness is obviously mine. Every flaw, factual error, and interpretive problem is the fault of Tom Brasino and Steve Tuvel. <laughs> I, suffer for, I suffer for their flaws. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you just mentioned Derek's first name, but what's his last? Katsum, C-A-T-S-A-M. And how do you know him? Uh, grad school. Grad school. Yeah, we were the three sort of troublemakers. I completely uh, love that, and I will get that book uh, to honor you and Tom. And then yeah. the other, um, the other book that I think that was came out this year that was really important and important for shaping how my own interpretation of what's happening now is this book called "The Constitution of Knowledge." Um, a defense of truth. Mm. I, I don't know if we've talked about it before. I but, think you've mentioned it. I haven't read it yet, though. Yeah, but I just, you know, I don't know that my understanding of the current problem that we have uh, in American society is summed up better than it is in this uh, book by Jonathan Rauch called Defense of Truth. Um, and, you know, he's a liberal. He's a uh, He's writes it for the Atlantic. He's from the Brookings Institute. Like he's, yeah. and then a couple of books um, that um, um, are pretty darn good that came out this year. And I'll just do like lightning round because we only have a few minutes. But the Great Dissenter, which is John, a biography of John Marshall Harlan, who wrote you know mm -hmm. the Great Descent of Plessy, um, Until Justice Be Done, America's. Uh, first civil rights movement from revolution to reconstruction. So it's great because again, I don't agree with everything that's in it, but I love that it's, I love the period that it takes in a uh, great book about Anne Hutchison that came out this year, the passions of Anne Hutchison, a book by uh, Alan Guelzo on Robert E. Lee, which was a hard book for me to read because, you know, I, it's like, it's like books on, well, I shouldn't compare them to Hitler, but you know, I've read all these biographies of Hitler and Stalin and stuff. And you like, it's hard to read books about people who you don't like or don't admire or whatever. And, but it's important to do so. And so I think it's important that we have a, a, a good, uh, honest accounting of the life of Robert E. Lee. Um, if you have any interest, nuclear folly, um, great new history of the Cuban missile crisis. Uh, we've plugged James Oaks before. 
Uh, read it. I finally read, read one of yours that you're recommending. Uh, Crooked Path to Abolition, uh, Gordon Woods, um, Power and Liberty also came out this year uh, about constitutionalism and the American Revolution. And then the final plug is for a book that did not come out this year, but will enrich your life for years to come. Um, because, you know, we talk about the canon or the great American whatever. Um, one of the things that I do many mornings, if I don't do it every morning, but is many mornings when I'm not in a hurry, I will read one poem <laughs> out of the Oxford Book of American Poetry. Uh, and if you want to know what America is about, one of the ways you can understand a lot about America is by just every day re reading a poem written by an American poet and it will enrich your life tremendously. Um, so again, it didn't come out this year, but this is, I'll recommend this every year. Um, Love that. Um, uh, Professor, that was brilliant to go through the list of books. We hadn't, uh, that was one of my questions that we had squi skipped. So thank you for forcing it in. I know you don't, I don't think you like this book because he's not a historian, but maybe I'm just assuming. Um, I really think all, all of us need to read Bomber Mafia from Malcolm Gladwell. I think the way he was able to articulate what happened in World War II between nuclear bombing and, and fire bombing is just a really interesting way to describe the history of the United States Air Force and where we are today. I don't, have you had a chance to read that? No, but let me plug something else from Malcolm Gladwell because I Shoot. think he's a tremendous storyteller. Yes. And, um, if he does a podcast um, on music and his Ooh. episode that he did on country music and songwriting is one of the best things I've ever experienced <laughs> on art. Love that. So, and he's the way, the way that he draws this, I mean, he's just a tremendous storyteller. There's yeah. just no two ways about it. Like, um, and so I, I apologize. I have not read that book, but I will just say that if you like Malcolm Gladwell, go and, listen to that episode on country music that he Love does it. Love because it. And, it, and it gets you right at the end too. Like, cause at the, in the end he may, I, should, I don't know if I want to ruin yeah, it. Yeah, don't ruin it. You've given yeah. us enough. You've yeah. given us enough. Um, so what, I have one last pitch and it's a poem that you may have read of, I think it just came out a day or two ago. So you might not have, uh, it's, uh, it's Amanda Gorman's new poem. And as a 23 year old, uh, I am just completely astounded about how, how talented she is and whether it's totally innate or whether she has a small group of friends or a family or advisors, I, I, her new poem just knocked my socks off of having optimism of going into next year. It, have you had a chance to listen to it yet? No. Uh, but I, I went back and I looked at all, um, all my poems to see if there was anything that actually came out in 2021 that I, and there was only one poem that really hit me this year. And it was by Joshua Jennifer Espinoza mm. called This Is What Makes Us Worlds. Mm. And I'm not sure what it was that hit me about it. And I didn't know and I didn't know anything about her before uh, I just read the poem and I liked it. But I kind of tucked it away in my you know, mental notes. But I looked her up yesterday and I had no idea that she's transgender and that most of her mm. poems have to do with transgender issues and stuff. But like, and she's from California too. I think she's at UC Riverside, I, I think. But um, Joshua Jennifer Espinoza, This Is What Makes Us Worlds was the only poem of 2021 that like, that I I'll, made note of and, you know, when it came out, so. I'll look that up. And Professor, you're right. We've got a full hour and we haven't even had any questions from the folks that are kind right. enough to join us. So um, you're right. We have way too much to talk about in this subject, but I do think it's important because I think we just make a, you, you've done some really nice um, summaries on what the mistake we make when we self-label and label others. And, and you're, you're teaching me some on that because I just think there's a lot of hatred and a lot of animosity and a lot of frustration with the other human beings that if we just kind of stop and talk music, we probably realize there's a lot more we have in common than we really differ over. So that's why I was excited to have this show and you've given us a lot of recommendations. Um, uh, last call and on uh, something like that before we go to Tony, Ben and, and Bart. Uh, just, I want to make sure that they all, you know, will agree that the kinks are the superior 
you know, unrelated band. Um, so I'm a few years older, but if for us, it was the Kinks, the Cars, the Clash, the Cure. Oh my God, what a what an era of music. Yeah, it, it, that was an extra. It, but for me, I liked the sort of slightly earlier era of the Kinks. But um, but yeah, I would agree with all those. Cars very underrated too. They were just especially. Well, and Jonathan Richmond as kind of the one of the people who invented punk music, mm. you know. And then when he when he when the Modern Lovers, you know, evolved into the Cars. And Jonathan Richmond stayed the solo artist. It's just weird that most people know Jonathan Richmond if they know him at all. He's the guy from playing the guitar in Something About Mary. <laughs> and you don't realize, like, this is the guy who wrote Roadrunner, you know, <laughs> which was later covered by the Sex Pistols. Like, I mean, anyway, I, I just love that, like, he had his pop culture moment as the guy playing guitar in Something <laughs> About Mary. Like, but anyway. Cars were great too. Yeah, what a what a conversation! You're so kind, Bart, Ben, and Tony. We're already over, but uh, we both feel bad for excluding you. Um, so, does any of this conversation entice you, or did we bore the heck out of you, Bart? No, I thought this conversation was fantastic. Thank you for having it. Um, I uh, I can't agree more that having um, discussions that involve culture, popular culture really does produce optimism, I think, in people's minds. And I think that's fantastic. You're nice. Tony, you're in a music. Oh, no, Ben, you took yourself off. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts, Ben? Yeah, um, well, for, first thing came to mind when I first saw the subject is, please don't talk about rap. Um, <laughs> rap is not music, in my opinion. It's uh, for people that can't sing. No, wait, Ben, I agree with you, but I bet the professor can take us down. Yeah, I'm sure he probably, he probably could. Yeah. Well, let's give him a shot since you ripped into it. Professor, right. what's your retort to that? Oh, oh I, it's just, if you're going to make a case for the evolution of pop music, it's impossible to ignore the significance of hip hop and um, the creativity of it. I, I, it, there's, it is the uh, bringing together of every element of music into one genre. And so to easily dismiss it as like, this is for people who can't sing, it, it's, uh, it's simply, uh, it's not true. <laughs> so, so, so Professor, I think that was a good takedown, but let me side with Ben for a second more. Um, this is going back 30 years in my army days. And admittedly, I was way more conservative in, the, in, a, in religious and moral and, than I currently am. I'm more forgiving and loving right now, but, but the offensive, I don't know if rape is the right word, but, but like derogatory towards women and curse words. And, and I, there's a lot of stuff that I found deeply offensive a long time ago. It, is it a legitimate complaint or no, that's part of human beings. And no, it's a completely legitimate complaint. Okay. But, but that's not that. I mean, that's like saying, um, I mean, we shouldn't like classical music because of Bach of Wagner or something like, you know, the, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you're right. Uh, I, I'm, there are some bad examples of this. You should, you don't judge something by the, the crudest. The worst of the, okay. Well, I tried to help you, Ben, but we got taken down. Now keep going with your point. Um, well, that was kind of the one basic point I wanted to make. The other thing I wanted to make is you're talking to an ex DJ from many, many years ago, but John, I got to disagree with you. It's got to be the 70s, so the best, best okay. thing. Well, that's because of the drug influence, Ben. But besides that, 80s got you beat. Well, and you're also a little bit younger than I am, too. So that doesn't, you know, that's okay. And um, you were an ex-DJ, huh? Yeah, I was back in high school and college. I decided not to pursue it. As so was I, by the way. No idea. I a, yeah. I was a DJ in college, too. And I'll make one, one yeah. point here just before I forget it. Joe Walsh, Eagles. You always a ham radio operator? Yeah. And so are you. And yeah. so am I. So every time yeah. someone talks about that, I've met him. I've actually talked to him. He is a great down-to-earth guy um, and also a great musician. One point I'll make of, so everybody else has a chance to, for those of you who have been paying attention to the series uh, Yellowstone, I think that has introduced a whole new genre to people who haven't paid attention to the eclectic music that's going on during that series. 
Interesting. I mean, now, what is that like, streaming? Because I've had enough people recommend it to me that I, now I think I need to just watch it. Is it Netflix? Or is it's it on it... Paramount right now, starting season two. But it's also if you get um, uh, Peacock, you can stream anytime you want. Yeah, and Professor uh, Meredith and I watched the first two or three episodes and got bored with it. But people think we were wrong and didn't give it enough of a chance. And so we, we probably have to pick it up again, too. So. It's kind of how I was with White Lotus. I tried to watch it like three times and then finally like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, and I couldn't get into Game of Thrones either. So ah, love this, Game of Thrones. But this one, my wife and I really enjoy. We've watched it several times, but the songs they throw in there are just, like I said, eclectic. And nice. To it. Excellent. So, Tony, you're going to take us uh, down and let's uh, take us down. Uh, you're going to finish us out um, unless Bart has another second bite of the apple. What, what do you think, Tony? No, I, I do love the 80s music, too. Uh, it was formative, and those were my formative years. And I think that what I love about the music, like The Clash, one of the people that I would also say was super, uh, like, hearing their music, I was like, what? What just happened? You know, like, that was that was one of those bands that really kind of shifted things for me at a particular time. And I think it's, we're right, that if we talked more about these kinds of things, we would find, you know, a kind of language we could, you know, could easily talk across things and have less disagreements. I mean, we might disagree about who the best band is, but but I think music is important, you know, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. But U2 was kind of the bridge for me to, you know, I went from, uh, uh, they were like, uh, I started in with U2 and then went back to The Clash. And, ah. and they, U2 were the gateway to The Clash for me. That makes but sense. Making sure that I li was listening to The Clash and then you know, of course, when you're 15, 16 years old, then you start listening to punk rock and Minor Threat and uh, uh, Fugazi was huge for me when I was young too. Uh, Black Flag, maybe. I, I, well, I still say that, you know, my um, my personal political philosophy can be summed up by a Fugazi lyric, which I'm sure is completely unintended because they're, um, you know, we're a left wing band, but um, we owe you nothing. You have no control. And you are not what you own, <laughs> you know, like I, that's, uh, I, I, I still believe those punk rock lyrics. Yeah. I, I am, that's not what defines me, but that, that, that like same cry for autonomy it, it, in those mm. punk rock lyrics that are just yeah. saying like, I'm in charge of my own mind and I get to define who I am. That's the same idea that's in woke racism. You know, it's, it, it, it you can read woke racism and, and learn that like we have to reclaim that we are in charge of our own minds or you can listen to Fugazi. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Now we're not ending for a second. Um, I, I want to intentionally plant a seed for next week's show um, because professor, like uh, one or two other shows, I think we might slightly disagree next week. Uh, we have gone through the most difficult of issues, abortion and LGBTQ and a Second Amendment. We've done a half a dozen conversations, video conversations on race. Uh, we've already talked about the insurrection once last year. Um, and we have gone through like the, the meatiest of controversial topics. And I think without exception, without animosity, without curse words, without disparaging motives or character of anyone that's signed in on the show the shows with us um, next week we're going to talk about what's happened in the last year or was it an insurrection i think it was i think you probably agree that that's the right word but maybe not maybe a historian would take some other approach for another period of years um, do you have any I, I really like this show because i think this is part of humanity too um, we can have all those difficult issues and still want to talk music and art and culture and and I don't know why we're simplifying everything down to its basest common denominator of us versus them or black versus white or good versus evil when it's all of this. Um, can you give a, a reflection on this conversation in relationship to next week? Uh, first of all, I would say I have convocation next week, so it's going to have to be two weeks from now. Oh, two weeks from now. Okay, good. Because uh, I, it's I, I have meetings from eight to noon next week. Um, but uh, yeah, I've thought about this because I usually let other people use whatever term they want to describe. But I need to um, I need to sit down and think about how how I would describe it. Uh, and 
I'm, I just want to, and I'll defer um, till next week. Any so. two weeks. Two okay. Weeks. Yeah. Uh, fair enough. Um, and and to give you a heads up, though, I I do plan on having a series of questions about it. That it's not going to pin you down and try to make you embarrassed, but it is going to try to get a historian's approach to it. Has this type of thing happened before? And if so, when? And if it will, what isn't that different when a you know, foreign agency did it versus, uh, you know, an Amer American ex-president? Uh, you know, so, and I'm not going to stick you to be mean. I just want to try to think about it in a different way. Bart and I would have a different conversation if we were having it versus you and I, a historian doing it. So that's my approach. No hidden agenda. Um, I do want us to think about this in a better way than we're currently thinking about it, which is the reason for me wanting to do a show at the anniversary of it, or the day after the end, or two weeks after. Fair enough? Yep. Okay, Professor, thank you as always for a, a delightful conversation. Yeah, great to see you guys. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all that stuff. It's nice and to you. Yep. Enjoy everyone, thank you. Yep, take care.